many people who showed up on time today. So welcome everybody. We're, uh, I'll go ahead and as the queue uh, accumulates over here, we'll let, uh, uh, give me a chance to go ahead and welcome everybody. This is an interesting conversation for us, uh, for the YU technology group. Sometimes people think about technology as computers, uh, cloud, uh, things like that. And there are so many different areas of technology that are important. Uh, they're important to society, uh, the fascinating developments that are going on. We've covered some of them. We've talked about health tech, uh, FinTech, uh, blockchain. Uh, we're gonna to continue to talk about those areas, but there's a really a tremendous amount that's going on in food tech and agriculture technology. And we wanted to expose people to it. It's um, phenomenally important. We thought we'd try to time it around to Bishvat for people to give it a little bit of a theme. Uh, so uh, just the, the week thereafter. And um, uh, friend Mitchell Presser uh, was really kind to introduce uh, me to Ken Zuckerberg probably a, a year or so ago. So it's actually taken a while for us to actually get this uh, program up and running. But I have to say, Ken has put together really a top tier uh, panel. And we are so thankful to, uh, to Chris, Orlando and, and Patrick to, to join this discussion to, to give us insights about what is going on in agriculture technology. There are opportunities over here for investment to seeing how the world is, is changing. Uh, many of you may be interested in commercial relationships and, and the like with the, the parties that are here or, or other. And um, we're, we're so excited to, to learn more about it and, um, and be part of the YU community. So Ken, I, I pass it off to you. Lawrence, thank you. I'm humbled and honored to be here and uh, uh, to, you know, terrific spending time with the entire YU community. So as Lawrence said, I'm Ken Zuckerberg at CoBank. I uh, serve as the lead economist for grain, farm inputs, and ethanol. Uh, CoBank, for those of you who may not know, is a lead wholesale lender within the farm credit system, which itself is the leading and the largest uh, lender to agribusiness and rural industries in America. I actually started my career in New York. Uh, well, started my career actually in Washington as a corporate finance analyst at Geico and then moved to uh, Wall Street in the uh, early 2000s at a, uh, to a firm that at the time was called Smith Barney Harris Upham. Later on, I started the insurance equity research uh, practice at Keith Brietton Woods. After that, I worked for Bruce Wasserstein at his own firm and then at Lazard Asset Management. And in 2003, I launched the independent research and consulting firm called Carlin Advisors. At that time, I started doing a lot of work with a lot of industries. And as I started looking at John Deere and Caterpillar and Agco, what was interesting was I was always a banks and insurance guy. And when I looked at these companies, I know that they sold farm equipment, but they really were banks. They really had banking-like uh, uh, income streams in the form of uh, 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 leasing and, and financing revenue. So I found myself at home looking at those companies. That transitioned to uh, looking at Monsanto and Climate Corp, the acquisition they made uh, back in 13 and 14. Uh, that got me into ag full time. And, uh, you know, when I joined Rabo, there, there was sort of no looking back. So with, with that out of the way now, um, you know, building on the, the Monsanto's acquisition of climate, look, there's been tens of billions of dollars invested in food and ag startups over the past decade. Our objective today, uh, just to build on Lawrence's comments, is to unpack the following. What's the deal with the digitalization of agriculture? Why, pe why are people investing? Second, where are the most interesting growth opportunities? Uh, third, what may be the most interesting career employment opportunities? Joining me to unpack these issues are three friends and really thought leaders in the space. Their bios are in the uh, uh, package or at least online. Uh, Pat Moran is, is president of Open Prairie, a rural investment uh, company. Uh, Chris Patterson, a pioneer in digital farming. Chris, I like your background, by the way. Uh, he leads... Uh, uh, what once was, I guess, a small family company called BA. 
Oh, you you froze up there, Ken. Okay, hopefully Ken will come back momentarily. Um, who was he introducing? Maybe someone can continue and introduce themselves. Maybe we'll just jump from there. Uh, yeah, he was just introducing myself, so I guess I can okay. continue and we'll we'll wait for Ken to jump back in. But uh, I live up in Calgary, Alberta, and uh, I work with Zarvio, which is the digital farming uh, um, branch of, of BASF on the ag side. And BSF is a, a large global company, I think maybe 160,000 employees or something like that, and, and works in virtually every country in the world. But uh, Zarvio is um, very much more uh, future focused. So we're looking out, you know, beyond 2025 to 2030 is our time frame, and trying to figure out how would uh, farming happen differently at that time. So we're trying to you know, uh, really improve and optimize and, and automate uh, uh, crop production. So keying in on what are the core challenges for farmers on a global level and when, you know, we think globally. So in terms of what is a farmer, well, it could be a, a 35,000 acre farmer in the Midwest or in Saskatchewan or something, or it could be, you know, a two acre farmer in, in India or, or in uh, Malaysia or somewhere. So we try to find solutions that can uh, be fairly uniform for us on a global level uh, for smallholders and large automated farms. So, Great, Chris, I guess you picked up where I dropped off. I said BASF and then uh, I evaporated. So anyway, um, you were probably to gonna say something witty. I don't know if you had something planned there. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, I liked your background and uh, and I, I was just gonna say, you know, you work uh, for what was a, a small family company called BASF, now one of the global leaders in inputs. Um, as we go right into the questions, uh, uh, Pat, let me uh, let me start with you if, if you don't mind. Well, Look, can you are... introduce Orlando? He needs some face time too here. Oh, should I should I should I drill down on Orlando first? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, thank you, Pat. I appreciate that. He's a good he's a good friend. I don't want to screw things over. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll I'll save the uh, I'll save the uh, the hard question for Orlando. But um, uh, there are uh, look, there's probably twelve different industry verticals depending on how you uh, uh, segment them out, and probably that's in ag tech and another dozen in food tech hundreds of ideas and companies to invest in. Can you tell us a little bit about Open Prairie's process, um, specifically what you look for, what's important, um, how do you screen ideas, and you know, finally, how do you guys diligence opportunities? Okay, thanks. And thanks to Yeshiva for holding this thing. This is a, it's a great platform for us to talk about what we're passionate about and how we make money for our investors. Um, Open Prairie, we are a, uh, operating our fourth fund we're a small private equity firm headquartered in Effingham, Illinois. Uh, I'm in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, we're licensed by the USDA as a rural business investment company. Uh, those of you familiar with SBA, know about SBICs, just take that cookie cutter, put it on rural, that's us. We invest in US rural EBITDA positive food and agribusinesses. That covers a lot of uh, Rural is the key component of that. And in three years since we've launched the fund, we're in our fourth year now, we've seen probably about 2,000 opportunities, one third of which are food and ag, and one third of those are rural. So if I reduce it quickly, we see a very good pipeline. And when we screen, we're looking at, at three sectors, uh, inputs, products and processing, and information and logistics. And within that, we've made... Uh, three investments in information and logistics, three in production and processing, four in the inputs. Um, our most recent one was a company in rural Oregon called Herd Dog. Uh, we, we take a portfolio approach. Those of you, of you familiar with the model under which we operate, we have a 10 year instrument. And Ken knows this, we're, it's 10 years, we're in the fourth year of an investment period. We try to have a three to five year hold on investments. In this particular fund, we've done 45% mezzanine financing, 55% equity financing. And we look at it as a portfolio approach. And remember that our, our duty is both financial and moral. We have to beat the market on a 10-year average. That's why we're called 
an alternative asset allocation. And we have a, a moral impact to make it an uh, impact on rural communities. Uh, you asked about diligence. It's like fishing with gill nets. You start with the big, big net first and catch the big reasons to say no. It's we think it's much better to let people know right away if we're not going to do something, save them time, save effort, be honest with them. But then as the nets begin to get smaller and smaller, you spend more and more money. And so the thesis is where we start. Does it fit? Are these things, are they rural? Are they EBITDA positive? Are the food and agribusinesses? And a portfolio fit. Can we get in and out within a three to five year period? Then do, you under, do we understand the business? We see a number of businesses we just, we could learn, but you want to have the instincts. And then beyond the capital, what can we add? Capital is great, of course, but we tell people we're a bunch of old guys who know everybody. And the importance there is to help the company socialize its products itself with an eventual acquirer or the next stage investor. So I hope that helps, Ken. I go on and on, of course, but you know, let's get some time for everybody else here. No, thanks, Pat. That that definitely is helpful. Orlando, let's uh, let's unpack a few of the issues there. When Pat was talking about the, uh, uh, you know, the the multiple mandate, you know, I, I think about ag tech as being sort of a perfect industry for ESG. Um, can you comment a little bit about that, and then we'll come back and maybe drill in uh, some questions on where you think innovation is taking place and. Obviously, feel free to talk a little bit about Acre Technologies and, and what got you on this journey uh, with us. Sounds good. And let me, for the benefit of everybody on the, on the call here, let me make sure ESG, environmental, social, and governmental in terms of the standard and the market that, uh, that we operate. Um, six years ago, my curiosity led me to agriculture. I'm not a farmer. I'm not in agriculture. You can hear that even in my accent. Um, um, I was a software engineer and uh, in telecommunications, been lucky enough to be a C-level executive in two companies that went public. And like I said, six years ago, I, I landed in agriculture and uh, I think I'm not moving out of this lane. This is the lane. And so what I'm hoping is, again, thank you, YU, for this opportunity that anybody here is inspired to get involved in agriculture um, just the same way that I am. And I was not here. Um, uh, we manage a group about 30 people strong. Um, I want to say about more than 70% of my company did not was not in farming uh, before they started joining the company. So I take a lot of pride in the diversity of bringing more people into this industry. And so that's an interesting legacy play. So anyways, um, do I believe that ESG or this category that we're in is investable? Absolutely. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it, right? So I think what may be relevant, Ken, for the benefit of everybody here is kind of what segments of that are relevant because it's pretty broad, right? So, so there's stuff that is like your digital ag, people that are doing remote sensing, a uh, little bit of the work that I know Chris is doing very well in Sarvio. Uh, that are people that are aggregating information because there's a lot of data in the farming and uh, we need to automate the process of actually investigating and predicting how to deliver better recommendations for input. So that's one category. The other category that I think it's, and that's where we reside. And there's some companies there that are doing interesting work. Semios, Fitech, we are, Sarvio, you know, doing a lot of work related to that. There's another class of companies that is the the group that I would call is more the biology side or the traditional chemical side of things. Um, I say that the, if you're motivated to get in the industry, biologicals is an amazing place, CRISPR, anything that relates to that. Uh, and there's some very interesting companies that are doing alternative crop protection products in the segment, which is very attractive. Um, uh, soil health, anything that relates to growing plants and being a good farmer starts with the soil. And so if you don't have a good soil, you don't have any plants and you don't have crops. So soil health is important and predictive analytics. So I can go on and on and on, but the opportunities are pretty vast. Um, I think that having to participate in wicked problems, you know, education, uh, government, healthcare, agriculture, these are big wicked problems. Anything that can translate more technology into an industry is very powerful. That's, that's the reason that I'm inspired to be here. And I hope that uh, some of the audience uh, feels the same way. Orlando, that's very helpful. You know, innovation is funny. Sometimes it's about doing the basics. Sometimes it's about the low hanging fruit and in farming, the idea of uh, repurposing manure onto a field and saving on fertilizer itself is innovative, right? But when we think uh, 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 
you know, a little bit more uh, uh, focused. Um, what areas today in U.S. farming um, are sort of crying for innovation? Is it the, uh, you know, understanding what is going on in the field, uh, both from the soil and, and the disease? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you think, is there one or two areas that are sort of most, uh, most important for, uh, for innovation? I can go in so many ways there. And so I'm gonna stay in a little bit of the lane that Chris and I live. And Chris can also provide some insight here, but I think that this idea of monitoring is big. So let me give you a, an analog here. If you go back to the 1930s, early on in life, and you see um, how many indications um, were they available, meaning blood tests, and then how many SKUs were in a pharmacy? There were five. There were five products, why? Because there were five things that we can di knew how to diagnose. If you go to the pharmacy now, how many SKUs are in the pharmacy? Tens of thousands, why? Because there's tens of thousands of tests that relate to what indication it's available to match the problem that you have from a product that is on the shelf. Well, guess what? In agriculture, we're kind of in the back in the day when it comes to how do we have monitoring technologies to understand how do we treat a plant, not an entire field on a farm, a plant, because there's a lot of indications that happen. And so monitoring that, it's powerful for understanding how to match the problems in the field with the products on the shelf. And I think that's where we live a lot in terms of looking at whether it's satellite, airplanes, drones, um, remote sensors, uh, ground sensors, to be able to describe better the conditions in the field that can allow us to enable this category that we all call precision farming. Right, so that we can spray right, uh, be more environmental, um, you know, stewards, of, and uh, and that we can uh, really deploy the right amount of chemistry that is financially smart for growers. Orlando, I love I love that analogy uh, to the pharmacy, right? So uh, you know, five diseases that were treatable, perhaps uh, with five uh, medications, and today thousands. And yeah, uh, thinking about the farm, uh, the the plant itself is is its own factory. And that's one plant, right, on a uh, field of uh, many ten, tens of thousands of acres in some places bigger. Terrific. So, Chris, uh, beyond explaining to me how you guys came up with the name Zarbio, it's it's not uh, intuitive. <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, Zuckerberg and farming. I don't, I don't know. You'll, you'll have to tell us on a different occasion. But look, you've been a pioneer 25 years ago, if I remember, 20, 25 years ago, with the AgriTrend uh, work that you did. Uh, understanding, um, bringing data to inform decisions. How, you know, could you quickly contrast how far the industry has come? And when you think about your ultimate customers, um, uh, you know, what, what are the, you know, what are the pain points and, and what are they looking for? Kind of building on Orlando's uh, a view of, of where, you know, there are some needs for innovation. Yeah, well, Orlando did a great job of, you know, matching, you know, what problem are you trying to solve with, with you know, the, the need for a solution. And uh, we live in a time when a lot of those solutions are coming, you know, from technology. So um, even some of the ones that are not necessarily about technology, it could be a, you know, a new business model, uh, but it's, it's usually got a lot of tech in it that that is the breakthrough but you know the problems of uh the problems that need to be solved right now in in agri-food are are pretty consistent uh no matter where you are in the world and no matter whether you're a large farmer or a small farmer so that's kind of where we started and uh you know when i arrived uh you know when we sold our our consulting and and data management company um, and I landed in this big global company. Um, our first task was, uh, you know, uh, develop what, what the future is going to look like and, how, you know, what problems will need to be solved and how do you build a business model around that? And, um, you know, we were looking at declining farmland and, and, you know, the fewer farmers, less labor, and, uh, you know, there's some barriers with, uh, society's acceptance of technology. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, consumer patterns right now uh, on how they purchase their food and what they want to eat, what they don't want to eat. We've got weather fluctuations and climate change, you know, all these different things where 
we're in our, our, our scope of what problems need solving. So we decided to uh, come up with a, a business model that was about, um, you know, delivering outcomes because regardless of how um, you, you know, reduce weed pressure in a field or regardless of how you uh, control diseases in a field, um, that still is a problem that needs to be solved. For you to successfully grow a crop, you need to do those things. So whether you do that with laser beams or biologics or, or bugs or, or uh, you know, genetic traits uh, or, or laser beams, you know, there's all sorts of alternative technologies that are coming out of regenerative agriculture movement. So regardless of how you control those things, they have to be controlled. So that's where we kind of came up with an outcome driven philosophy. So what you really need to do is have a weed free field how you achieve that there's many options and and technology will change over time but but it's really the outcome so that's where we we think a little differently instead of selling the ingredients or selling the technology we're selling the outcome so that's a key thing that was a breakthrough for us and it's worked out really good we've got um, you know really good uptake uh, on small farms and large farms all around the world uh, on that philosophy so Lots of technology, including, you know, Orlando was part of that technology suite that we're working with, uh, you know, to try and deliver these solutions uh, to, to control the problems in eggs. And there's, you know, um, one of the things I'll point out is that um, the traditionally the large companies have enough resources. They would develop everything internally, just hire more scientists, hire more uh, techies and, and, uh, start building. Um, in the culture we live in today, a lot of the top talent in our industry and a, a lot of the top grads that are coming out of the universities are landing up. They want to start their own companies or, or maybe not start their own company, but they want to go work for one of these early stage innovation companies. So for a large global company to access that uh uh, that pool of talent and their creative ideas, we have to become a lot better at reaching out and, you know, um, learning how to work with uh, other external companies. And that's not always easy when you've got a big company that's got, uh, you know, a warehouse full of lawyers that's there to protect the company. And we've got contracts that are three inches thick, you know, and stuff like that. How do you interact with two kids in a garage with a really cool idea, you know, that don't have insurance and they don't have a lawyer and stuff. So we've really had to, you know, step up our game and think, how can you give that, that company a comfort level that they're not going to lose their intellectual property or get their idea stolen or, or anything like that. So, so the, this whole concept of external innovation has been one that's allowed us to proceed very quickly and uh, harvest more ideas and, and move faster down the path towards innovation uh, through uh, relationships with external companies. So, so that's a big change we're seeing right now. Yeah, Chris, that's great. Orlando, it looked like you had perhaps yeah, another I, comment. So. I, I just want to follow up. So, so, and I know that you and I talk a lot about this and, and Chris is familiar with this element, but Chris has something very powerful that I just want to add a parenthesis here, which is managing the outcomes. And, and what I want to put some spotlight for, for everybody to appreciate is that the outcomes that we are tracking today are different than the outcomes that the growers you know, were managing to in the past. I'll give you an example. You know, there's this little product, minor product that you might have heard, glyphosate, Roundup, right? It's a herbicide, kills weeds, very simple. Guess what? The outcomes that in the past would have worked, you know, glyphosate to kill weeds, doesn't work anymore. So part of what the, the industry is going through a massive transformation because the adaptation of climate change is catching up with the chemistry. So crop management practices where it used to be more prophylactically, we call, where you spray and you pray and everything is good. And it's kind of like insurance, farming with insurance is you put it in and you forget about it. You can't do that anymore if you wanna actually be successful. So this outcome-based element is really driving a massive wave of innovation that to be good farmers, you have to understand what is happening in the field with a lot more resolution and time sensitivity to be able to respond to the changes of what's happening in the field. And I think that's when you hear the word innovation, transformation, those are the things from an entrepreneur 
we latch onto to say, okay, there's opportunity there. And I know you and I have talked about this topic about you know, how much the entire industry is undergoing transformation, particularly in the way that inputs are marketed and, and so much more, but I'll stop there. So uh, Orlando, very interesting. Pat, if I sit, put myself in your shoes for a minute, I look at, you know, uh, large company BASF, which again is one of the five, uh, five or six leaders in uh, uh, seed chemical, uh, along with the diversified business. Then I look at Orlando as a, a startup, which uh, has, uh, uh, you know, a, a, client, a, a client relationship and a collaborative relationship with, uh, with BASF. So they're sort of the public company to invest in, the startup, and then as you and I have talked about, you know, the funny things about, uh, uh, you know, what people think about as startups is, um, you know, you, you really have to understand what the long-term value proposition is, because if the net present values of uh, the customer relationship is here, but the funding annual burn is there, that's not really a business, that's an inferno. So Pat, so Pat, how do you, how do you square that triangle and how do you, you think about where to, you know, to place the investments and, and just generally comments on, on maybe the two gentlemen. Well, it's, um, you hear the word, you have to have an exit plan. And from an investor's perspective, uh, we want to put money to work in interesting companies that make a difference, but people trust us with millions of dollars. So one of the first questions is, how do we get out of this? What's the exit? I've worked most of my career in life science. And the model there, if I can uh, build on Orlando's uh, analogy of the pharmacy, in pharmaceutical industry, the same thing goes on. Huge overheads, they have their own R&D, but the model now is to buy a smaller company. Big companies, and Chris, pardon me if I'm overstating it here from BASF, big companies are manufacturing and distribution channels. And sometimes it's easier to buy a small company at a good value and plug it in to those manufacturing and distribution channels than address some of the bigger problems. So that exit, and in our view, in our firm, we pride ourselves in trying to figure out what are the pathways to an exit and how do we make that happen with relationships, networks, and the capital? I don't know, does that, does that make any difference? So, no, Pat, that, that's helpful to level set it. I agree with you. I think uh, without the exit strategy, it's, um, you know, there, there can be an extended time horizon. There, there can be a lot of money. Like I said, if, if you know, your annual burn uh, is greater than the, the, you know, net present value of that business you're creating or the customer relationship, it, it, it's, it's, the burn continues indefinitely, if not forever. Um, no, fast, fascinating. Let me also just mention that uh, we have the ability to take questions as we go. Uh, I think the panelists would definitely like to hear some other areas of uh, questioning beyond my own. So please, uh, you know, any things that come to mind topical that we've covered or otherwise, please feel free to put that in the chat and we will, uh, you know, we will do that. Maybe let's... Uh, pivot while we're waiting for some questions into uh, long-term employment opportunities. So I'm not sure if any yeshiva students go to bed thinking, all right, I want to learn how to farm a field or let me leave with my degree and, and learn uh, direct uh, about farming. However, I bet you that the ag tech uh, uh, and the technology folks at yeshiva are thinking about farming data, you know, farming consumer data, bringing algorithms in to create businesses and business models. Um, Orlando, if, if you would think about, you know, students and alumni that are on the line that are interested in technology and, and perhaps, uh, you know, following the lead that, that you took, you know, where would you guide them? Where, where should they look um, as, as sort of, I don't want to say the hottest areas, but the most intriguing long-term? It's tough. Consumer, I mean, chasing consumer um, uh, markets and appetite, it's a, it's a pretty tricky business. I mean, I, uh, I know Nick Rosa in Chicago and, and Sandbox Industry and, and Chuck Templeton and S2G, and they've made some massive investments in the typical alternative protein, you know, burgers, et cetera. And there is, I mean, there's some very, very powerful hockey stakes. I think that if I were to get into the game downstream, 
is um, it's really related to appreciating where that consumer demand is going. Um, consumer demand has some expectations of your typical nutrient density, uh, compliance for how that product came to me, to my mouth, right? Um, and then looking at um, uh, plant as, as medicine, which is a, another category that I think is gonna be very powerful. I think that the conditions that we live in, especially under pandemic and a massive change have really wreaked havoc in our mental health. And so when you look at how food plays into the way that food is distributed, which is gonna be significantly different than anything that relates to food delivery services and nutrient density under a completely different um, uh, physiological characteristics for humans. I mean, I sit in a little room all day long, don't have to go outside, don't socialize. What does that mean in terms of our habits and our, our patterns in terms of food consumption, et cetera? So I think that there are some very powerful opportunities related to that category, um, um, but it's it's tricky. It's tricky, and and so my thinking is always, uh, you know, really try to align. And I think Pat does a lot of work in this category, and I know Ken you as well, which is product market fit. Iterate, come up with something, but don't. It's not. It's not. It's not a product until somebody else, not your mother or your family, says that it's a product. And so iterate through that as many as, as often as you can, and then continue to grow. I'm lucky to be an investor in several opportunities and be involved in angel investing is very powerful. So, you know, that's another thing to, to, to make sure that um, people connect with, you know, get a sponsor, get a, get somebody who's in that industry. Um, and uh, um, I, I, I have a good friend that works in Tyson, uh, the head of ventures and, and, and Tyson Foods, big company, right? Um, they're doing a lot of in, innovation and packaging, by the way, because just looking at materials and how to deal with the distribution of food and how the food gets to you that has the same quality that you get it when you're in a restaurant, they're making big bets just in material design for packaging and how the food gets delivered. So like I said, no shortage of ideas. I, mean, I, can, I can spend an hour and a half here and more <laughs> throwing different things on the wall, but um, it's only what gets investable and what the market responds is what, is what matters. Thank you. One of the things uh, <clears throat> I think along the same lines of what you're just talking about there, Orlando, but the way I, in my brain, I, I visualize our industry, agri-food is kind of upstream, midstream and downstream. And uh, upstream is, you know, where does your food come from? And, and midstream is, you know, what happens to it as it gets, uh, you know, aggregated and processed and packaged and everything. And then, you know, downstream is where does it go to reach the consumer, either through uh, farmers markets or grocery stores or, or restaurants or, or whatever. But, um, you know, when you say, where do I want to focus? Um, which, which one of those do you resonate the most with? What are you passionate about? Right. And then within that, um, what are the problems that need to be solved? And when you find a problem that needs to be solved, is that a big problem or a small problem? And, uh, you know, how valuable would it be to actually, you know, if that problem could be solved, what would that be worth? You know, and that's how you think about, is this a business or is this, uh, an innovation? And, uh, so that, that's where, you know, there are many, many opportunities in, in all of those categories. And I, I think the one, if, if I was to pick one that excites me a lot is, you know, I, I'm seeing the decommoditization of food. So that's another way of saying kind of what Orlando was saying, you know, we don't want, want bulk wheat off the ship. We want to know where was this wheat growing? Uh, why is it different? Uh, it, what does it have in it that the other wheat doesn't have or what does it not have in it because of the way it was growing or where it was growing or who grew it and how do you tell the story and how does how does all that stay in how does that story stay intact as it goes from upstream through midstream to downstream so when I'm sitting in a restaurant I just could order the food but I also would probably be more intrigued if I could know who grew this food and, and, and how did they do it differently than, than somewhere else? That's, that's worth a premium to me if I can know the story of this food and, and then I can feel good that it was more nutritious or less toxic or whatever. So um, that uh, to me, like being able to tell the story of the food as, as our industry gets decommoditized, 
uh, in any one of those upstream, midstream, downstream categories, I think is a massive opportunity. Um, we, we all of a sudden have the ability to collect data. Data is how the story will be told, but it's how do you package up all that data? How do you communicate that data from a farm through a processor, you know, to a restaurant in an industry right now that is very siloed. The data doesn't communicate easily. So, so there's some problems there that need to be solved and they're very, very big problems that would be very valuable. So, so that's, that's one idea. And then Ken, and if, lots of stuff. To... And if I can add, I mean, Chris framed it perfectly. Let me add one more angle here that I think is going to be important for people wanting to get in the industry, but the upstream um, um, it's divided. There's two sides of this. And we talked a lot about it, which is the big ag, with a, with a capital, which is the production agriculture as we know it. And then there's the other ag, which is my daughter still feels that all the food, food comes from Whole Foods and that um, everything that grows in ag is actually in the rooftops of the buildings in Chicago. And it doesn't quite, and it's not a ding against vertical farming and people that are doing that. That is a very powerful component, but let me make sure that I frame this for you. If you have an opportunity to build something that has better ESG, going back to this notion of having an environmental stewardship. If you do make a 1% difference in big production ag, think about that as opposed to being in a small ag and making a big difference. They're both good. I'm just choosing this lane because I think that if we make a bigger difference, if it's been so small in big ag, that can that means you know, enormous consequences for the planet and for populations in general. So I just want to frame that in terms of people understanding that, that the upstream um, has different lanes that you may want to kind of think about. May, may I add another lane to the highway? Please. Uh, thank you. Crease, it's, uh, crease it's the whole backbone. No, no. It's the whole lane of, of uh, compliance. I spent my career running companies um, that were regulated by the FDA. I know the D part of FDA very well. The F part, and it's not an adjective, the F part is becoming much more similar to the D part now. And so you're sitting in the restaurant, something happens. Lawyers get involved. And all the way from the start of the seed manufacturing, all the niches along the way, there is an opportunity for standard operating procedures, training, compliance, records, documentation. And back to your original question, Ken, about opportunities for careers, that's a, a, a burgeoning part of, of the food and agribusiness uh, sector. Uh, this whole thing of having compliance records, training, documentation, so that when there is a problem, I can go to the regulator or the attorney or the judge and say, here are my records, here's the documentation, it wasn't us. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's fascinating how many different layers of the onion we can unpeel. Um, we actually have received a few questions. Let me uh, let me drill down on uh, one of them. You know, we talked a little bit about indoor farming, uh, controlled environment. Agriculture is uh, sort of the formal term, uh, not just, uh, you know, it started with uh, greenhouses and Holland is very good at that. But you know, Pat, we recently had a company that uh, now now came or is about to go public in a SPAC, this app Harvest. You know, this is one of the uh, the the few uh, uh, private to public situations. Um, the question that came in talked a little bit about <clears throat> valuation, 20, 20 million dollars invested and a uh, billion dollar valuation in a market that uh, is you know, at itself close to peak valuations. Pat, how do you, how do you look at that? Is that another exit? Is, is, is there, uh, you know, God bless if you can get it right. But, um, you know, is, is that more sustainable? Or are there any barriers to others doing, uh, doing that? How do I get out, How do I get out of criticizing hype? <laughs> I can't think of a way. Uh, yeah. The so-called controlled environment agriculture, CEA, is a big deal. It's maybe 5% of ag right now but it's growing and you have to think about just the logistics. There's opportunities there uh, for premium crops, for crops closer to where they're being delivered and eaten and just the availability of labor as well as robotics, all kind of great technology going into CEA, a bunch of different models. And you talk about the valuations. Um, we are kind of hard on valuations, but that's maybe a, 
a function of the stage of investor we are. We we want a bigger piece of the of the action when we invest, so we tend to arm wrestle over uh, more modest valuations. Uh, but it's 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 really growing, and some of the interesting opportunities are in the technology, whether it's growing in the air and water, in fish waste. Uh, one place I know they can show the provenance of the dirt. No, all dirt is not the same, and they can uh, do, make claims on that that count too. So. Uh, I think that at least that's how we're thinking about it. Interesting. Chris or Orlando, any, uh, any comments just on the uh, interesting dynamics of, you know, this industry has, you know, had four or five uh, exits, um, you know, since Climate Corp, the trend line has been lower with the exception of, uh, you know, this, uh, this recent one. Um, you know, do you think uh, this is a uh, industry that is IPOable? Uh, is it too early, Chris? Should you guys buy Orlando and then spin out a more a bigger, you know, uh, innovation unit which has, uh, you know, multiple uh, uh, divisions to it? Should the equipment companies come together more with the uh, input companies to, you know, bring together economies of scope in addition to economies of scale? I'm throwing a lot at you, but I just figured that, you know, from an outside investor or somebody is newer to the space. There's many different ways you can go, but I'm also mindful, Pat, as you said, you know, uh, uh, this is a different industry versus uh, others, and the uh, the go to market is a bit more complicated. So, Chris, how, how do you think about it? If you, you know, because you you also take on investment responsibilities sometimes. So, how how do you look at this? Well, I, yeah, I think um, I'll 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 repeat something I said earlier is like how big a problem are you solving and what is it worth to solve that and so so I think one of the things I see a lot of times is people start something because it's you know something they think is cool or it's a new technology that hasn't been seen before and and they go fast down that path without building the business case scenario so there's you know this the business case there's the you know how is this going to change the the industry um the scientific case there's many things you got to figure out but uh um in the end it might not be that big of an opportunity uh the other nuance in this specific to this industry is uh you know we work in a seasonal industry and the iterations that orlando mentioned earlier uh, often can't happen as fast you know you can do some things like zipping back and forth between Chile or Australia and, and North America or something but but often um, you know you got to wait uh, a season before you can um, do your next iteration so so some of the things um, uh, that that are very good business cases and we'll get there with a big exit just take a little while longer an egg. So that's one of the frustrations of an investor. And Patrick can probably tell us lots about this. You know, we often read the magazines about uh, how things work in Silicon Valley and stuff, right? And we hear how fast these valuations go up and, and how fast the iterations happen. And um, we're working with biological systems in a seasonal industry. So I, I just think the expectations have to be uh, set a little different, but there are many companies I think that have persevered, um, you know, manage their cash flow, and have very good businesses forming. And uh, and I think there are many good uh, opportunities to either IPO or be acquired. Uh, there's there's lots of um, um, I guess examples where I look at companies and I say <coughs> they have a great technology, but they're trying to become all things to all people and become a platform. And they should be, you know, talking to the companies who already have big reach into the market and saying, I'll be a module or a, a little vertical within your platform and, and go to several platforms with that strategy, right? And, and, and they instead invest their resources into trying to become a new competitor on the platform scale. So that's where I think uh, some of that stuff will get sorted out one way or the other. Uh, and there'll be lots to look forward to, but but I think um, you know people often speak about egg uh, agri food and the the pace that innovation happens, the pace that exits happen. They talk like they're disappointed, but I think uh, people who grew up on a farm 
are, are probably seeing that, hey, this is a different different time frame, but it, it, it lands well. People are very, very uh, perseverant uh, is a big thing in this industry and, and uh, people know how to manage their cash flow. So they get there to the finish line, but it just takes a little while. Chris, that's helpful. What I'm hearing you talk about are a few things. Um, you know, Pat, the uh, time horizon that you talked about is 10 years. Thank God, right? This is not a four to five year exit industry. I think uh, sometimes that gets confused uh, to Chris, to your point. Um, next, Chris, what I also, I think heard you say was, um, you know, if you're a terrific app, that's wonderful, but you may not be the app store and trying to be the app store versus the application um, you know, is, is needs to be thought of in, in terms of uh, how you go to market. Very interesting. Uh, Orlando, I was going to, uh, a question came in on food waste, but I, I, I don't want to miss the opportunity for you to weigh in because. Uh, I, I will. So I, I think that I, I, I'll go back to what Chris said, which I think is very powerful. And, and, and Chris, what you, I want to anchor around what you said, which is from a startup perspective, the thing to watch out is how big of a problem are you solving? And the way that I would frame that even further is there's two things as a startup that and this is kind of the construction of Acre and what we do. You're trying to look for a unique value proposition, something unique that you're doing. And so you have a merit either around a technology for us is we fly drones an interesting way to scare the grower into kind of treating the fields in the right way and to matching products with problems in the field. Um, the other part of the problem that we need to solve is not just that piece, it's really, uh, it speaks to what Chris mentioned, which is access to channel. Uh, we don't have the access to channel to make what we have available for the masses. So it's really a integration challenge. And the way that I, 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 I've heard this many times by people like Pat and, and other VCs, it's like, okay, Orlando, you have an awesome point solution, but it's not an end-to-end -end solution. So you need to move from a point solution to an end-to-end -end solution. And this is the curse from a startup. Do you as a startup want to become the end-to-end -end solution to create another market adjacent to you know, the company? Or do you want to build that end-to-end -end solution as a component of the big company? And I think I'm a little critical, I, I wanna say about this market. And the way that I would frame it is this way. I would challenge everybody on this call to name more than five telecommunication companies today. I bet you'll be hard pressed to name the six. Agriculture is the same. This is a very vertically integrated market. So there is no middle market in this industry. So when a good company shows up, it basically gets gobbled up by the big guys, right? Because there's a unique competitive advantage that they have. So I, I hope to see a day to your point, Ken, that there is a bigger middle market of companies that can sustain themselves because they can work in, in collaboration in bridging this gap between being a point solution and an end solution and leveraging the access to channel that the big companies have and the opportunity that the technology can afford for a smaller, a bigger addressable market of small innovators to be able to continue to feed the industry. And uh, I, I know that's a little critical, but I'm just trying to at least put, put, the, put the thumb in something interesting mm -hmm. for us to talk about. Or, Orlando, that is fascinating, right? Because what I'm impressed about is there's uh, actually a group of uh, uh, chemical companies, American Vanguard is in that uh, middle to smaller to middle side, which is very innovative, very interesting. Um, you know, FMC has uh, sort of reinvented itself. Um, it's a mindset issue. Uh, I think uh, if, if we put ourselves in, in Pat's seat, Pat, it would be very good if you had that competitive tension of BASF bidding for assets with others. Um, the, you know, word, the word auction comes to mind. Yeah, we got to get that yeah. paid here, right? Yeah. You, know? <laughs> um, uh, you know, and it's interesting, Chris, because uh, what I found uh, previously working with a European company in my career, that the timetable to convince uh, folks that it's a good idea, um, that in and of itself requires a skill and patience that I've read a lot of books on professional development. I still don't know how to develop that patience, right? Because go to market and opportunity evaporates quickly. So maybe there will be sort of a revamp of, um, you know, corporate innovation because companies, one company buying another company for 130 billion and, and uh, you know, uh, having to sell great assets to companies like yours um, and then seeing its value implode for other reasons. To me, that's not sustainable business in general. Um, let me 
pivot into a different area. Uh, this question comes from David Gray. David Gray in the UK, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, David's asking a little bit about food waste and the conundrum in, in uh, unlocking this. Part of the reason I don't like to talk about the UN thesis on feeding the world is that we waste so much today. And if we stopped wasting 35% of what's produced, by the way, a lot of it is on the consumer. You know, if we stopped wasting that, we'd be able to feed the world. By the way, we'd have less climate change because the amount of greenhouse gas and, and uh, uh, to toxicity that goes from food waste into landfills is tremendous. But what David's asking about is there's a lot of solutions that are science-based, gene editing, packaging, et cetera. Science is the key, but sometimes science startups are the hardest to fund because uh, venture capital investors may not be comfortable with that complexity. Pat, is that, is that fair in your mind, not comfortable with the complexity or perhaps separately, is there perhaps a key to unlocking um, you know, some of the good technologies involved with food waste? Um, uh, the key to unlocking, we've seen a lot of companies that use the, the idea of food waste as a predicate. Either there's a feedstock for fertilizers. There's a, a one company I'm very familiar with. They're doing a great job of taking waste from grocery stores right. and selling it as, as organic fertilizer and making money doing it. Uh, one of our own companies had to give a pitch for something we've invested in company called Green Dot Bioplastics takes ag waste and with some really novel and um, defensible IP converts it into bioplastics with particular emphasis on marine bioplastics. So all the plastic in the ocean uh, could be degradable uh, using this technology. So, I mean, you talk about the complexity. We are small investors. We like niches. And the whole idea is to reduce the complexity into something simple where there's a market where the company can thrive and we can make money. Interesting. The, um, you know, KDC Ag, I think is the, uh, one of those, uh, perhaps the one you were mentioning, the uh, supermarket uh, food waste going into uh, uh, repurposing into fertilizer. To me, that's interesting because if a tomato or a uh, orange or a, a grape uh, is not uh, desirable, can't be sold, you know, that's going to be thrown out. So that's interesting. I know a company called Anuvia, I did some work on a while ago, also takes it right out of the municipalities. Um, interesting, that's intriguing about the plastics uh, and a, uh, entity you mentioned. Um, Chris, a while ago, you and I talked about some uh, companies up in Canada where you're from that uh, uh, sort of have a uh, structured approach to composting. For the record, as most of you know, I drink a lot of coffee and uh, after a trip to Costa Rica, decided that I had to keep my grounds into a composter in the backyard, but I'm not gonna solve the world's climate change problem e even with a lot of coffee grounds and, and fruit. But um, Chris, how do you, <laughs> What have you seen, and is there uh, any barriers to some of those interesting companies up in Canada doing this uh, to get funded? Yeah, I'd say um, you know there's oh probably a half a dozen companies I know of right now that are taking you know food waste and and repurposing it into uh, you know fertilizer ingredients and. Um, it could be either just raw compost or or taking it further and saying let's let's. Uh, Add, add stuff into the compost to make it a more complete ration. And that's, those are good businesses for sure. Um, there's also, uh, you know, some interesting technologies around repurposing the food waste into stuff like, you know, like uh, dehydrated uh, vegetables for, for soup or for camping or whatever. Right. So um, lots of options there. And I think there's general interest in that category, like uh, the, the, the concept is popular. I think these guys have struggled with, uh, you know, trying to get it off the ground in a big way. Like it's, you know, it's making something that's truly scalable that you can plunk down in any city and have it work. But um, probably my, the, the biggest thing I've learned by interacting with these companies is how much food volume gets wasted. And that's just only at the grocery store level. That does not include restaurants and homes. But uh, just at the grocery store, it's, you know, hundreds of tons just in a city like Calgary, right? 
and that per day, you know, so it's just, uh, and you look at that stuff and there's not a lot of problem with it. You know, the, most of the stuff I'd probably still eat, you know, it doesn't look blemished or anything like that. So a lot of it too, uh, is a regulatory issue. Like, um, can we have a sensor that tells you when that fruit is really getting to the point of where it's disgusting or dangerous instead of just X number of days, you know, if one provider gets it there sooner than the other provider, is it an advantage or do they both get categorized the same and thrown out the same day, even though one guy might have figured out how to make five more days of shelf life there, right? So right now it's hard to capture that value with our regulatory system. So that's where I think there's an opportunity there to reduce food waste. Yeah, I know we spent a lot of time talking about the uh, corn, soybean and wheat, but it is amazing uh, the food waste that happens with fruits, vegetables, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I, I did hear about some technologies years ago that sense, you know, if a strawberry from Driscoll's in California is on its way to Fort Lauderdale in a, you know, in a truck, if it's going to go bad, uh, shouldn't you, you know, not go to Fort Lauderdale, stop in Mississippi and sell it at a Whole Foods there. So, you know, there, there's interesting things. We are getting close to the end of the time. I wanted to mention a few things. Um, I think for the questions that came in, and there were a number couldn't answer, uh, Lawrence and Eliza, I think what we'll try to do is I'll try to capture these questions from you and, and go back to the panelists, get answers, and perhaps put it in a document. Um, next, I think that, uh, uh, Lawrence, you may have some uh, closing comments or Eliza some closing comments. I'll just uh, perhaps go into one final area. Um, you know, people talk about the blockchain as perhaps a way to organize lots of different uh, parts of the business. Uh, Chris, going into the food waste side, the traceability side, Orlando, I think going into the, what is the chemical technology or, or um, input that you're gonna put on the field. And, and Pat, I, I, I know that, you know, we've talked about one of your portfolio companies and, you know, where they think about the data and what's meaningful and, and what is ground truth. Um, maybe just as the final question here, how do you all think about it? Um, is that also early days or are we onto something? And again, we're talking about blockchain and not Bitcoin, which uh, is a currency that uh, may or may not have anything to do with blockchain. Um, who wants to go first? Pat, you're shy, so uh, should I pick on you? Uh <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, what, was, what was first prize? Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, as, as I understand blockchain, which is a very sophomoric understanding, it fits into what I said earlier about compliance and documentation. If you can show how a crop was grown, who grew it, who touched it, you have the evidence, the documents along the way for a recall or a look back and gives you confidence that you can, I wouldn't use the word claim, but come close to that you're claiming what this tomato does or that it is a tomato. And that's, that's how I understand the application of blockchain in this industry. There. Thank you, thank Pat. And obviously uh, uh, people on the line know that we're all friends. We tease each other quite a bit endlessly. Uh, Chris even shaved today, which was nice to see. Um, Orlando, <laughs> do, you, do you wanna? Yeah, what I would, I, I would say this, I, and, and again, I'm, you know, I, I grew up and I live technology and breathe it every day. But here's what I would say. Technology is not a product. So it, it, there's, uh, you know, a lot of us tend to kind of to have long conversations over cocktail around uh, blockchain and food waste and all these things are big problems. I think that what really matters is to hone in on solving a real problem, small as it is, that is directionally correct in the direction of what the bigger notion of idea that you want to advocate or envision in the future. So I, my, my caution is, yeah, blockchain, all these technologies, transparency, compliance, good. Technology is not a product. So you got to kind of make that leap and make sure that uh, um, that's factored in. Yeah, I would, I would, uh... Uh, say that you know blockchain is, is a piece of technology but it's more about can you leverage uh, you know telling the story of your food does it help you that's where the value is going to come from if you can differentiate and decommoditize using something like blockchain 
then that's the technology that enables the solution. And, uh, you know, like we're, we're going from being able to treat whole fields to, you know, zones in the field to treating one plant at a time and then one leaf at a time. Um, how can we better capture the value of going through all the trouble and expense of, of reducing that? Does it show up somewhere in the restaurant that this, this particular batch of food has less pesticide in it than that batch did, right? So uh, a technology like blockchain can facilitate that, that value capture. So we're, we're producing value. Can you actually capture the value? That's a different question. And so I, I think being able to tell the story of your food, um, it, it, it's a business model but it's gonna require technologies like blockchain to, to unleash the, the value capture. Excellent. Well, let me uh, thank the three of you for taking the time. Uh, interesting dialogue here. I feel we could go on for uh, many hours uh, uh, in the future uh, discussing this and I know we will. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it uh, back over to Eliza for uh, closing comments. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, thank you, Orlando, Pat, Chris. This was so interesting. I really enjoyed it. It was just a lively conversation between all of you. And uh, interesting, you should know that we actually have had a number of students who have chosen um, to think to learn about the field, uh, the, the, the field of farming um, because many students have chosen to make Aliyah, to move to Israel, to go into farming. Um, and I don't know if many of them have ever considered doing it here in the US. Um, so I wanna offer that anybody who's on the call who's interested in, in mentoring students or uh, connecting with YU students who are interested in this field, um, please, please connect with me. You can email us. I'll give you my email, easy email address. It's alumni at yu.edu. Um, but in general, we appreciate everyone who joined us on this call. And of course the panelists, uh, because there is just, it's so enlightening for us to be able to use this time when we're all on Zoom and all remote to participate in these conversations. I'm sure for, certainly for myself, I will speak for myself, but I never really thought about this topic and it's so interesting and somewhat similarly to your daughter, Orlando. I mean, I knew that food didn't just come from Whole Foods. I know it comes from a farm. I just don't know much about those farms um, other than apple picking with my family. But uh, it's just really, uh, really great and really interesting. So thank you all so much for your time. Everyone who is on here, thank you for joining us. And if anybody would like to connect with any of the speakers or the participants, please feel free to email us. Again, alumni at yu.edu. And we're going to share a recording of today's program as well. Uh, so feel free to be in touch. And thank you all so much. Have a great day. Stay warm, stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.